You are now listening to the Bayshore Community Church Podcast. Our mission is to connect to God, connect to people, and to serve the community. Thank you for joining us today and wherever you are listening. We hope that this message inspires you, encourages you, and transforms you. Our prayer is that this is just the beginning of a conversation between you and Jesus. Enjoy the message. So, so psyched to be with you all. And if we have not met before, uh, my name is Joel, and I have the honor of being the campus pastor at a Rehoboth campus. So shout out Rehoboth, they're tuning in with us right now. But I'm so glad to be here with you guys. And um, I, know, I know we lost an hour of sleep last night, but I'm going to wake you up today. Like, I, I am a, people in Rehoboth tell me every single week, they're like, you're hyper. And I still haven't figured out if that's, you know, a compliment or not. But I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, I, I know this about me. I love participation. Love it. All right. And Fenwick and, and Rehoboth, I know you're like you're watching a screen right now. So I need you to be like extra participative today with me. And every campus, like I, I'm down if you give me some preach it's, some, so, this, some that, whatever, whatever that was, do that. Some get after it. We're in Gumboro, so shuck the corn will work. You can just shout, shuck the corn. And so every campus, just to make sure you're going to play along and participate with me today, we got some first timers in the room. We have people watching online right now. So can you just make some noise for them or shout, shuck the corn or something right now? That's pretty good. Oh, I love it. Um, hey, I'm, I'm bringing you into a series that we're doing in Rehoboth called I-Y-K-Y-K. Who's confused? R- raise your hand if you're confused. Fenwick, raise your hand. I know you're, f- you're confused. All right, um, I-Y-K-Y-K is sort of like internet shorthand, text shorthand that means if you know, you know. There you go. There you go. Um, so let me, let me give you an example. All right, the whole idea is like once you've experienced something before, now you know, because if you know, well, you know. Um, so Millsboro, you all just got Aldi. Come, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah for Aldi right over here. Um, so, and by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, I think Aldi is following Bayshore. We got one in Rehoboth. You all just got one here in Millsboro. Fenwick, I'm believing for you. You're about to get an Aldi over in Fenwick. That's what I'm thinking. Um, my first Aldi experience was about a year ago, and uh, we walked in, and my wife uh, held up these knockoff Girl Scout cookies. And I was like, no, those are not real Samoas. And she's like, no, they're Benton's Caramel Coconut Fudge Cookies. I'm like, I ain't doing it. I'm not going to cheat on Girl Scout cookies, all right? I'm a Girl Scout cookie man. And she said, they're $1.25. And I was like, shuck the corn, baby. Put them in the cart. (laughs) Has anybody had to knock off Girl Scout cookies from Aldi? They're amazing. So, woo, yeah, listen, and once you know, once you've experienced these, now you know, because if you know, there you go. And so um, today we're just going to talk about something that if you've experienced it before, like those cookies, you know all about it. And so let me kind of set up today this way. Just a question. Uh, I'm curious, how many of you went to Disney when you were a kid? If you can remember back hundreds of years to your childhood, Okay, guys, see those those hands. Um, Some of you did not raise your hand. And if you didn't get to go to Disney when you were a kid, congratulations, your family has more money than the rest of us because you didn't spend $73 million to go to Disney. Listen, to this day, I do not know how my parents were able to afford to take us to Disney when we were kids, okay? Like, we didn't have any money. We couldn't even afford the knockoff to the knockoff brand. You know what I mean? And uh, I grew up, my dad's the pastor here. Most of you know, like, Pastor Danny, that's my, that's my dad, in case you didn't know. Um, I'm just like 25 years younger, so I, so I have that extra 25-year energy. Um, but we didn't have any money. We grew up in a, I grew up in a trailer in this church's parking lot. And the reason I know we didn't have any money is because our church vehicle, or our, not our church vehicle, our family vehicle was a 15-passenger church van. That's true. And when you're like in elementary school and you're, parents pull you up to drop you off in a 15 passenger church van, you're going to hear about it. Okay. And so somehow, I don't know how my parents drove us all the way down to Disney in like 1987 in the 15 passenger church van people. And I would show you pictures, but we couldn't afford a camera. So there was no pictures. (laughs) All I remember about Disney is, is two words, 
Space Mountain. Come on, yeah, you guys know about Space Mountain. Maybe you know about it in Rojo with and family. Listen, Space Mountain, I was like blown away when I saw Space Mountain. If you don't know what Space Mountain is, it's, a, it's an indoor roller coaster you ride in the complete dark. And I'm worried, just like it makes me anxious just saying that out loud. But as a kid, listen, I was five years old in 1987. And this is, in 1987, it was normal to give a five-year-old a wood-burning kit for Christmas. I know that because I was five years old and I got a wood-burning wood burning kit for Christmas. And so like things were kind of like safety was like not even a thing back then. But, but safety was a thing for Space Mountain because I was not tall enough to ride Space Mountain. But my dad, I don't know if he like, you know, taped you know, wood blocks to the bottom of my LA night knockoff shoes or what. But somehow at five years old, they let me ride Space Mountain. Woo! I was, it was the best two minutes of my entire life, people. I was so excited to get on that ride. I was like, I cannot wait to tell all my friends who make fun of me for my 15 passenger church van that I rode Space Mountain with my mother. <laughs> They're going to respect me now. <laughs> But I was like 41 pounds, and so like the seatbelt didn't even fit me, and I didn't care. I was just excited to be on the ride. My mom was so worried about me flying off Space Mountain. She held me down the entire ride, and her sunglasses flew off of her head during Space Mountain. And her sunglasses to this day are still on Space Mountain, the ride. And I was not worried at all. And it made me realize that the older you get, the more worried you get. Isn't this true? Now, uh, I, have, uh, I know this because like, I have two kids, and two years ago, we took them to Disney, and all they wanted to do was ride the Tower of Terror. I was like, how about we ride the teacups, because terror is not in the name. My kids didn't even think about the teacups. They wanted to ride the Tower of Terror, and so we get on the Tower of Terror, and that's not a seatbelt ride, people. It's a bar ride. And so I told like, the person, I'm like, is, is there like, are there seatbelts? You know, I need a seatbelt f- for my kids mainly for me, but for my kids. Um, and this like 17 year old Disney worker was like, you're gonna be fine, dad. I'm like, I didn't know this $200 ticket came with a side of condescension, okay. I was so worried the entire time. The Tower of Terror is terrifying. Here's my point. Um, my point is this. If we can find something to be worried about at Disney, the happiest, the m- most expensive place on earth, Isn't it true that we can find something to worry about anywhere on earth? Isn't that true? Oh my goodness. Like my my two default emotions are anxiety and worry. This is how bad it is. I worry about preaching messages on worry. How jacked up is that? And there's so many things to worry about. Okay. Like there's, you know, there's bills to pay. There's kids to look after. There's parents to look after. There's bosses to please. There's family drama. There's baby mama drama. Hello. There's baby daddy drama. There's marriage drama. There's relationship drama. There's family drama. There's health drama. There's fix the roof drama. There's inflation worry. Hello. I feel like I'm still making payments on eggs I bought in December. You know what I'm saying? There's so much to worry about. And so if you've got anything in your life worrying you right now, all right, just if you've got one thing or a lot of things, on three, just shout, shuck the corn at every campus, okay? One, two, three. Shuck the corn. Oh, you all are worried too? <laughs> There's so many things that worry us. And, and in this room and at every campus, I bet you, some of you, you worry all the time. Did you know there's a 2019 uh, survey or study they came out that said two out of three of us are worried all the time, like right now. The other third, they're on Xanax. <laughs> I don't think that's in the study, but that's what I personally believe. 91% of you teenagers, it's worse for teenagers, 91% of teenagers are worried all the time. Now, uh, I know this, uh, I don't have a teenager, I have a nine year old, and her name's Nora, and uh, Nora's spiritual gift is worry. I don't know where she got that from. Um, and her biggest worry in life right now is accidentally eating past expired food. Which is a problem in our house because we take the expiration date as a suggestion. 
You know, we just are hoping to like get it in the right year. Okay, everything else beyond that, personal conviction. That's how we feel about it. Anybody like do this in your house? Is this how you do expired food? Yeah, yeah, it's Clafford. I love it, all right? It builds up immunity. That's what I think. But even if something is still good, my daughter will look at the date and she'll be like, Daddy, is this okay? I'm worried it's going to kill me. How about you eat it? And if you don't die, I'll eat it after you. So my nine-year-old is worried. 91% of y'all teenagers are worried. Two out of three of us adults are worried. I'm worried about the other third of y'all. We worry about the fact that we worry, which is why I'm so thankful for this book. Because this book is our roadmap for all things, including worry. And so I want to tell you about a guy in here uh, today named King Jehoshaphat. Everybody say King Jehoshaphat. All right. Now, if you're pregnant right now and you have a little boy coming, don't name him Jehoshaphat. I couldn't even spell him when I was writing it down in my notes. Okay. So, but King, King Jehoshaphat, he was the fourth king of Judah and he was one of the good ones. All right, he was the one that one of those that, who followed God. He was a good king, but he had a lot of things that worried him. And he had a lot to worry about. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat and Judah, they were being attacked by all these different armies. They were being attacked by the, um, the Moabites. They were being attacked by the Ammonites. They were being attacked by the Menunites. And if that wasn't bad enough, they were being attacked by mosquito bites. That joke's for my dad, all right? My dad's been telling that since we took the 15 passenger church van down to Disney. Um, that's a preacher joke. Um, so there's three different armies coming against Judah. I mean, there's plenty to worry about. So let's, let's pick up there. Let me show you how the story goes. This is Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. It says, The armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Mayunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. And messengers came and they told Jehoshaphat, man, this vast army from Edom is marching against you. And Jehoshaphat was, and let's all read this together at every campus on three. Jehoshaphat was one, two, three, terrified by this news. So King Jehoshaphat, he's freaking out. He doesn't just have one problem. He's got three problems. He's surrounded by problems. And I think like we can all relate to that because a lot of us, we're not worried about one thing. We're worried about all the things, right? You're worried about your boss and your ex and your kids and fixing the car. And you just started to die and somebody brought a whole box of donuts to work that morning on the day you started to die. And you're like, I just cannot handle all this. And whenever you say you can't handle something, there's always an overcooked Christian who shows up, you know? And they say, oh, God will never give you more than you can handle. If you're, if you're worrying, you're sinning. Listen, number one, that's not what that verse says. You left out the main part. And number two, and we'll put this on the screen. Anxiety isn't a sin. Did did you know like Jesus was so anxious in the Garden of Gethsemane right before his crucifixion that he was sweating blood and it says that he was overwhelmed to the point of death? Hello. And that's sinless Jesus. And so if you're worried that anxiety is a sin, good news, anxiety isn't a sin. Anxiety, we'll put this on the screen. Anxiety is a signal. Everybody say signal. All right, let me explain it this way. If we can throw that next slide up on the screen. Um, yeah, he got some signals here. Anybody um, ever seen any of these show up on your dash in your car? Anybody ever seen any of these show up on your dash? Some of you are like, that's a picture of my dash currently. <laughs> Anybody got any li- like signal lights on your car right now? Any warning lights on your car right now? Oh, yeah. wow. All right, we're, we're in that camp too. My, my wife drives an 11-year-old Toyota Sienna minivan, and it is sweet. Sweet, man. I'm telling you right now, it's 11 years old. 75% of our door handles still work. <laughs> Means one of those door handles does not work. Um, and and right, it, it pulls to the right so bad. I mean, it's been doing this forever. It pulls to the right. So we're always in like the shoulder on Route 1. If you see a van going down the shoulder of Route 1, <laughs> that's our family van. All right, we're just rocking over there. 
because there's always a low tire, uh, air, the air is always low in one of my wife's tires. And so the check tire pressure light has been on in my wife's car for 11 years. <laughs> it, is, it is never not on. It is always on. It, you know, the most impressive thing about the check tire pressure light on in my wife's car is that the light hasn't burned out yet. <laughs> it's like some Toyota quality there. I mean, the light is still on and I... There, there's some men in the room. I see you all men. Men at every campus. You're, you're judging me right now. You're like, why don't you just fix the tire pressure in your wife's car? Listen, I have. All right. I, now, I don't, I don't probably put enough air in it enough. You know, I'm a, mil, I'm a millennial. I do not own an air compressor. But I put air in a tire all the time. I've, I've had it patched. I've got new tires on my wife's van. And so I'm just at the point now, I think her personal hobby is driving on construction sites and getting nails in her tires. <laughs> she always has low air pressure in her tires. And whenever I get in her car, it's, you know, the light's on. It's always on. It's like Motel 6's slogan, like, we'll leave the light on for you. She always leaves the light on for me. And, and so, like, what, what is that signal, all right? Just, just let me ask you a question. The signals in our car, the warning lights in our car, are they a signal for us to do something, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Those, those are signals for you to do something. Anxiety is the same way. Anxiety isn't a sin. It's a signal for me and for you and for all of us to do something. And so what do we do when our anxiety light is on? I have a few ideas for you today. And so if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The first idea is this. When your anxiety light is on, it's a signal for you to pray. Now, here's why I say that. Um, uh, This is exactly what King Jehoshaphat does. So he's got armies all around him. He's all sorts of worried. And so let me show you what King Jehoshaphat does. In verse 3, it says, Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news, and he begged the Lord for guidance. And so what did he do? He prayed. And he he prays. This is one of those fancy prayers that, like, the most spiritual person in your family says at Thanksgiving dinner. This is a fancy prayer like that, and this is his prayer. He says, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. Whenever we are faced with any calamity such as a war or plague or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us. And this is so good. And you will hear us and you will rescue us. Us. King Jehoshaphat is like, God, I am praying to you. I am trusting in you. I am choosing to put my faith in you. I know you're going to hear us and you are going to rescue us. Come on, somebody. That's a good prayer, isn't it? That's a good prayer. And when your anxiety light is on, it is a signal for you to pray. Now, I, I know what some of you all are thinking. I, I'm a preacher, so I can read minds. I don't know if you know that preachers can read minds. We can read minds. I know somebody in Fenwick is thinking this. You're like, okay, okay, Pastor Joel, professional Christian Pastor Joel. I can't pray fancy prayers like King Jehoshaphat. Good news. Me neither. I, I am from Gumboro, and my favorite phrase is shuck the corn. That's who I am. And so when I'm anxious, you, you know what, what my prayers normally sound like? Help! God, help! Send help! Our prayers don't need to be fancy. They just need to be us telling God what is on our mind. And that's exactly what happens here. And when God, in this verse, it says, when God hears us, he will hear us and he will rescue us. He will hear us and he will rescue us. Now, I'm a realist, so I know some of you are like, okay, so you want me to, you know, just pray to this invisible person? Uh, not going to do it. I'm going to follow science. I am not going to pray to some sort of invisible person. So I want to tell you something crazy. Um, There's this uh, lady named Dr. Caroline Leaf. 
And I'm going to read a quote from her. Before I do that, I want to read her biography, okay? So this is who Dr. Caroline Leaf is. If you're kind of like, oh, I don't really know about prayer, um, this, is, this is her bio. She's, she is a communication pathologist and a cognitive neuroscientist with a master's and PhD in communication pathology and a BSc in logopaedics, which I don't even know what that is, specializing in cognitive neurology, i.e., this lady is way smarter than me, all right? She is the smartest person in the room, all right? This, this woman is really, really smart, and this is what her research found, and so we'll put this quote um, from her on the screen. She's found out that it has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Wow. Wow. How crazy is that? Prayer can literally change the chemistry in our brain. Now, what's funny about that is a lot of times we think worry is going to change our situation. Hello. (laughs) Worry never changes nothing for me. But prayer can actually change our brain. Everybody say, what? What? There you go. Well, I liked it. You're in in it with me. And so here's what um, I've done since I found out this information. Uh, Every morning for years, um, I, I get up and I read my Bible at my kitchen table. Now, it is chaos in my house in the mornings. I have a seven and a nine-year-old, and um, my kids, their spiritual gift is yelling. <laughs> they're constantly yelling, okay? Like, my kids, are, they're, they're not Baptists. They are Pentecostal children. <laughs> I wish they'd be a little more Baptist when I'm reading the Bible because, like, they are so loud. But I, I always read the Bible at the kitchen table because I grew up watching my dad read the Bible at his, you know, at our kitchen table. So... I want my kids to see me reading the Bible. Um, But as soon as I'm done reading my Bible, this is what I do. Literally, this is what I do. I face plant into the Bible. (laughs) And I pray for, I try to pray for 12 minutes. And I say, God, I pray for these kids because I can hear them right now. I pray for my wife. I pray for my family. I pray for our church. I pray for our team. And if prayer can change our brain, God, I know you can change what I'm worried about. And I pray. And so when, when we're worried, guys, what do we do? We pray. It, it, it's like this warning light, warning light, warning light, warning light. Uh, it it kind of reminds me of this. We all have um, this uh, almond-sized thing in our brain called the amygdala. Everybody say the amygdala. amygdala. We're having a science class today. I don't know if you know that. But your amygdala, its main job is to scare you to death, to protect you from death. Yeah. And so the problem with your amygdala is your amygdala is an overachiever. Have you ever worried about something that didn't happen? Has this ever happened to anybody? Research shows that nine out of 10 things that you worry about never happens. But our amygdala is like, no, no, no. We're just going to say warning, freak you out, scare you every single day. Here's an example. Um, my two best friends in seventh grade were uh, Andy Mason and Bo Dukes. I think we have a picture. Yeah, these are my, my best friends from seventh grade. And um, Bo and Andy both go to our Hobart campus right now. And so shout out to Bo and Andy. And um, when I was a kid in seventh grade, every, almost every Friday night, me and Bo, uh, the guy in the middle, me, obviously, we would go to my friend on the left side. And uh, we'd go to his house on Friday nights. Andy's house had two rules. Rule number one was keep the volume down, which when you're three teenage boys, not easy, okay? And so we figured out a way at Andy's house on Friday nights how to silent wrestle. Anybody know how to, you know, what silent wrestling is? Anybody? No? Because we, I think we invented it, okay? And here's how silent wrestling works. It's like regular wrestling, except you can't make any noises. That's how silent wrestling works. And so I remember one time, true story, seventh grade, Bo Dukes, right over here in the middle, um, he body slammed me on a record player. I'm talking like full on WWF, like pile driven into the record player. And I didn't scream or nothing. It's the biggest accomplishment of my life. I didn't say, I was like, because I was keeping rule number one, which was keep the volume down. The second rule in Andy's house was never, ever, 
open the front door and let anybody in. And Andy, I think his parents had been robbed in the past. So like, I get that that was a, a fear for them. That, that makes sense. Except one Saturday morning, uh, we woke up after a long night of silent wrestling. And uh, we woke up looking into the living room and look out the living room window into um, a black Lincoln pulling into Andy's driveway. And we saw these, uh, these two people get out of the car. And I want to be sensitive in how I say this, but these people, they were the oldest people I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> like they may have been Adam and Eve. I mean, they were so old and they started walking to the front door. And I say started because this part took 20 minutes. And Bo and I, we figured out on their 20 minute walk that these were Jehovah's Witnesses. But Andy's amygdala told him these people were going to rob us. And so they get to the door and this is a true story. Andy makes us, we're in seventh grade, he makes us lay flat on the ground in the living room. And, and we think, hey, well, let's talk to these people. They took 20 minutes to get to the door, Andy. Andy's like, no, 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 no. They are going to rob us. They are going to get us. And I'm thinking, unless this is a Metamucil shakedown, <laughs> I think we're going to be okay. But his amygdala was saying, warning, warning, warning. And he was scared to death. Why? Because our brain is naturally wired to worry. But prayer supernaturally rewires our brain not to worry. And so when we have our anxiety like going on, it's not time to worry. It's, it's time to pray. I love 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this. It says, cast, cast all your anxiety, not some of it, all of it on him because he cares for you so much that he made it so that prayer can rewire the worry right out of your brain. Everybody say, whoa. It's pretty amazing. And so when your anxiety light is on, it's time to pray. Here's the second idea. When your anxiety light is on, it's a signal for you to pause. Now, I'm going to admit, I don't even like my second point today. But... <laughs> I'm going to show you why I say we should pause, all right? So you got King Jehoshaphat, things are going off the rails, all kinds of things to worry about. So after he's prayed, here's what happens in verse 12. All right, this is the tail end of the, pray, the prayer. And this is, a, this is a great prayer, by the way. The tail end is, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's good. As all the men of Judah did what? Stood before the Lord. Like, I'm like, well, no, no, you, you got three armies attacking you and you're just going to just stand there. And it wasn't just the men. It was like, they brought their wife, the kids, the dogs, they all, the little ones, are all, they all showed up to stand. I'm thinking, don't, don't just stand there. Do something, you know, call 911. Call the prayer hotline at 88.7, the bridge. Call, I mean, call somebody. But sometimes God's like, don't just do something. Stand there. One of the, one of the best verses you'll see anywhere in this book. You probably know it. It's, it's Psalm 4610. And it says, be still and know that I'm God. Sometimes God says, don't just do something. Stand there. Sometimes God's answer to us is, be still. And know that I'm God over whatever it is that you're worried about. Be still. Now, I don't, I don't know who this is for. Maybe somebody in Fenwick. Maybe it's for Howith. Maybe someone in the room. Maybe it's all the campuses. I, I don't know. But some of you aren't being still right now. You're anxious about something, and you are, you are running around trying to fix that. You're like Patrick Mahomes, like running out of, the, out of the pocket. You know how he's always like, you know, running all over. Like you're just running trying to fix something, and God has a text message for you today. I don't know if you know. Did you know God sends text messages? 
He does. He even sends emojis because here's the text message God's had for some of you. Stop. Be still and know that I am God. Now, I, I, I know some of you are like, okay, <laughs> Pastor Joel, so I'm not supposed to do anything and that's going to fix everything. Sometimes. Sometimes it works like that, but not always. Sometimes our situation, our circumstances don't change, but what changes is God gives us a peace inside that nobody can explain. And so what do we do? We pray. We pause. And then the last point is this. When your anxiety light is on, it's a signal for you to worship. Now, I'm going to bring up a sensitive subject. I don't know if you're ready for it. I know Rehoboth is not ready for it, especially the front left section, because I know (laughs) y'all. But it's been about a month, so I, I feel like we can talk about this. Eagles fans. I can't believe you all lost that Super Bowl. Oh, my gosh. Listen, I'm not an Eagles fan. If you don't know, I'm a Ravens fan. I root for the Lord's Bird, you know, the Raven. <laughs> Woo-hoo, there it is. But you got, listen, I became like a sort of a bandwagon Eagles fan during the Super Bowl. I'm like three quarters in that game. I'm like, it's going to happen. Like, I'm on my, my couch. I'm whispering to myself. I'm like, fly, Eagles, fly. You know, I'm singing it. And then Rihanna came and flew on some platforms in the halftime show, which was weird. Because they're always weird, those halftime shows. Anyway, but I thought, that's a sign. She's flying on the platforms. The Eagles are going to win. And then the fourth quarter came along, and the rest were like, here, hold my whistle. And, and you had Patrick Mahomes out there. Patrick Mahomes, I think he had an amputated leg. His leg was injured so bad out there. You know, he was, you know, running around like he had a hitch in his giddy up. The whole, he looked like a little kid stole the Aldi, you know, stole the cookies from the Aldi. He's trying to get, like, he just, well, Patrick Mahomes should not have been in the Super Bowl. He should have been in the emergency room. But Eagles fans, you all let him score 17 points in the fourth quarter. And you got Jalen Hurts who crushed it that whole game. Um, did amazing. Uh, but the final, I don't know if you remember, the final play of the, the game. It's 38 to 35. The Chiefs are up. And they're 60 yards. The Eagles got the ball. They got to go 60 yards. And you know the play that's got to be called. You got you to throw a Hail Mary into the end zone. You're like, there's six seconds. You, this, is all, this is the only play you can play. And Jalen Hurts takes the ball. And he throws the most lame duck pass I've ever seen in my life. To the, nobody was even close to the ball. The ball, barely, you watch, it barely even went 20 yards. I'm thinking, did, did the football hit an actual eagle in the midair? Like, how did the ball not go? Like, Jalen Hurts had been crushing it the whole game. He can throw, he's not even hurt. Patrick Mahomes, he's got an amputated leg. He's throwing the ball further than Jalen Hurts. But that play, like, I, I don't know. I wouldn't have called that play. Um, but my team can't even figure out a way to play our, or pay our quarterback. So what am I, who am I to judge? Um, but here's my point. King Jehoshaphat, he's prayed. He's paused. But now the battle is about to start. And so it's going to be three armies against his one little army. And so he's got to call a battle play. And he calls the craziest battle play I've ever heard. Like, if I'm King Jehoshaphat, I am not calling this play. Do you know what play he called? He sent the worship team to the front line of battle. Listen, no offense to our worship teams at all our campuses, but the worship team? Like, what weapon did you bring? Oh, I brought my guitar. I'm going to play it to death. What about you? Oh, I brought my, you know, tambourine. There's always somebody in church with a tambourine. There's probably someone with one here, right? You know, there's, and so like King Jehoshaphat's like sending the crazy church tambourine person to the front lines. Listen, if I'm King Jehoshaphat, I'm not calling that play. I'm sending, I'm sending Dwayne the Rock Johnson to the front line. I'm sending Jason Momoa. I'm sending Sylvester Stallone from Rambo to, I'm like, that's who I'm sending to the front lines. They send David Crowder. Very strange play to me. Um, sounds like the Eagles Super Bowl. Just strange. But 
Right before the battle begins, there's this speech that a guy named Jehaziel, I think that's how you say his name, he gives to everybody on Judah's side. And it's like the most amazing locker room pre-battle speech you've ever heard. And this is what this speech says. This is, some of you, this is why you're here today. This, this is so good. He says, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army for the battle is not yours, but God's. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Is that a locker room speech or is that a locker room speech? Woo! Woo! So good. And so let me, let me read that again. I think somebody is worried in the room. And if you're worried, you got something going on. I want to read this over you. If you want to just close your eyes and feel this, like, this is so good. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. The battle is not yours, but it's God's. Aren't you thankful, church? Aren't you thankful that the battle's not ours, but it is his? Are you thankful in Fenwick and Rehoboth? It's his. So the battle starts. And three armies against one army and they got they got the worship band out front i mean they, they got they're singing carry joe i don't know what they're doing out there but what happens is with the worship team out front the other three armies get confused and they end up attacking each other and because they're attacking and beating each other that's how king jehoshaphat's army wins with the worship team up front and my biggest takeaway from that is this they didn't just worship after the victory. They worshiped before the victory. And so we're going to have somebody come uh, up from the worship teams at every one of our campuses right now because we're going we're gonna to worship before the victory. Is, is that okay with you guys? If that's okay, just say that's okay. That's we're going to worship before the victory. And while Corey's getting in place and somebody at all of our campuses is getting in place, I want to tell you about my friend named Joyce. And uh, we have a picture of Joyce. Uh, Joyce is um, at Rehoboth. Joyce is amazing. She is one of our guest services volunteers. So friendly, so always smiling. But right now, Joyce is going through some health stuff. And um, right now, she has to use a, a cane to, to help herself around. And last Sunday, before the service started, uh, Joyce walked into our lobby in Rehoboth and I could just see the worry on her face. You, you, have you seen that on someone's face before, just a concern and worry? Joyce had this worry on her face, and she came to me, and, and she said, Joel, I need, I need God to speak to me today. And she said, I'm, I'm so, I'm in this worry, I'm in this health battle right now. And we prayed, and, um, and I hugged Joyce out in the lobby before the service started. And then the service started, and we sang this song uh, in our service last weekend called Surrounded, which is a song we're about to sing. And I was in the front row and I, I, I turned around and looked back behind me and I saw Joyce who's in a battle right now and she put her cane down and she was worshiping. And it made me emotional because I was so inspired that she would worship before her victory. And Joyce, I, I, don't, I, I know you're in Rehoboth right now. I'm praying for your victory. And church, can we believe for Joyce's victory together? I mean, I'm going to believe for Joyce's victory for you, Joyce, and we're, we're, we're behind you, but I don't know what you're worried about, what you walked into church with today, what you're carrying around, what that battle is that you have, but I do know something amazing happens when we, when we worship before our victory. And there's this really cool line at the end of the uh, story in King Jehoshaphat's army and everything that happened. After everything that happened, um, there's this phrase, and I want to read it to you, and I want everybody to just stand at every campus. If you could stand right now. And I want to read this because somebody, there's something here for somebody. Verse 29 says this. It says, the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel. The Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, so Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. Do you know who fights your battles? Do you know who fights your battles? The Lord himself. So how do we fight our battles? We pray, God, I need you. I don't know what to do right now. I don't know how to 
work through this, but I need you. We pray and that changes our brain. And we pause. God, I want to do something. I want to fix this, but I'm just going to be still. And that you're God. And we worship. Because when we're surrounded, we need to remember that we are surrounded by God. That's how we fight our battles. Church, that's how I fight my battles. And so we are surrounded by God and he's the one who wants to rescue us and heal us. So God, I just come before you today as we close in prayer and then we sing this song, God. I just pray that for there's someone in the room, there's someone at one of our campuses, they're worried right now. There's so much anxiety just weighing on them and they feel like they're in a battle. God, I pray that this last song will be them worshiping before their victory. Because when we worship before our victory, it does something. It does something miraculous. And I pray that we'll, we'll pray this week about it. We'll pause this week about it. But right now, we are going to worship because we are surrounded by you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us on the Bayshore Podcast. I want to encourage you to take this message you just received and allow it to go deep into your soul and let Jesus do the deep work that only he can do. A special thanks to everyone that gives generously to Bayshore. It's because of you that this ministry is possible, creating life change all over the world. You can be a part of spreading the message around the world by going to bayshore.online and clicking give. For all things Bayshore, visit bayshore.online to find out what your next step may be. You can subscribe right here and share this podcast with your friends and family. Thank you again for listening. God bless you.